Um, yeah, earlier this, today, a uh, second period, um, I waited for five minutes, nobody was online. So I'm assuming there are various reasons for, that can vary from load chain to wherever or whatever, um, as to why um, students weren't attending. It could be that because um, other lecturers are not uh, currently present because of the academic conference they're attending. Um, <clears throat> but then I also recorded the session and I realized after I finished recording the session and I've done some of my better work, um, I did not unmute it. So that particular recording is of absolute no relevance. Um, and hence the fact that I'm just repeating it and recording this. Um, some, for those who are going to listen to the recording, um, some logistics again. Uh, we'll be finishing with chapter 15 today, as well as chapter 17, because we have a double period. Um, I will be available um, 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon for the Friday session online. Um, but uh, we won't be starting new work because we actually finished the curriculum today. So, in effect, it's actually um, a period that you can actually take off, um, put your feet up, um, relax, reward yourself because you've gone through a very difficult period. Uh, the last number of weeks with tests and assignments, and you need to get your mind cleared um, and prepared for the exams. That's literally just around the corner because next week's our last week, and then we're going to study week. Um, but anyway, um, what we've done in the previous chapters is we actually first identified what the process is that will be followed by an organization if they have vacancies in their sales department and they need to recruit. Uh, and then select the correct, uh, correct candidate and then appoint that candidate um, and then motivate that person to um, or people to um, perform uh, and then reward them for their performance. Yesterday, we looked at some of the motivation um, theories. Um, Vroom's expectancy theory was the one that um, we can highlight because that's probably uh, the one that is most appropriate for chapter 14. Um, <clears throat> And today we're going to be looking at how do you structure your workforce because, um, and you'll see as we progress through the chapter, it's actually um, quite simple, but um, it all starts by looking at the different types of, or it will differ from the type of industry you're in, the type of product you are selling, if you're selling to the consumer, if you're selling to um, the business market. Um, but there are four very popular um, um, organization structures that's usually used. Um, the first one, the, the most popular one is a geographical one. Um, example I can think of, for instance, is if you have a company like Pick and Pay who has a national footprint, there will be a geographical structure in each of the provinces. Uh, it will be the image right at the top, um, number A in your illustration, which you'll also find for those with textbooks, um, 11th edition, page 374. Um, and you've, you'll find that, um, that that's quite commonly used for, for businesses with a national footprint, whatever industry they're in. We also have a product specialization structure, for instance, where um, a company has a different, uh, as, as a range of product lines. Let's say, for instance, you're in manufacturing and you are manufacturing um, um, parts for um, Toyotas, for instance. Um, and it could be commercial vehicles, it could be... Um, um, industrial vehicles, um, whatever, but the whole range. But because of the product line, it might include specific products like the fans, the radiators, the, the water pumps of um, um, all these kind of um, parts of um, um, the product. And you need an expert in each of those. Um, so if there are customers with problems in this specific, specifically apply to the business market uh, selling, You'll have a, um, um, a product spe specialization uh, structure in place to deal with that. So you've got your expert salespeople who specialize in radiators or um, water pumps, or if there's related um, items like that, uh, maybe one or two or three different products um, within the complete product line. You also have your industry-based structure, which is number C. Um, they each have similar functions, but they also have then very different functions. Um, uh, for instance, um, banking, as well as manufacturing, as well as retailing, all have um, financial um, um, need financial experts. 
But a financial expert in retailing is not necessarily going to be uh, an expert in, in banking finance, for instance. Um, and then finally, the fourth one is the account size, where you basically um, use a structure or implement the structure according to your different types of customers. You might have um, medium sized customers, you have key accounts, um, you have new customers, you have small businesses, for instance. Each of them have a specific designated sales team um, that um, look after their, um, their specific needs. We are now going to look at each of these um, different organization structures and just compare. We, we've identified already um, um, what we see on the screen. We've identified already what these uh, structures are all about, what the geographical structure is about. I've explained it to you, but basically this is just, um, again, summarizing that. Um, <clears throat> if we can progress to um, the customer-based one and the account size one. Um, and then you'll see that um, in these next number of slides, we'll be comparing the strengths and weaknesses of each of these organizational structures. Um, the strength of the geographical one is that it's very simple. It's already within a country like South Africa. Um, to, geez, now I'm actually put my foot in my mouth here. I, I, do we have nine provinces or 11 provinces? I'm not sure, but we have a number of provinces between nine and 11 in our country. So there's already a geographical border um, between the different uh, regions in our country. So therefore, the geographical one can very easily, uh, can very, um, can very easily be implemented if you have a presence for your business in each of these um, regions in South Africa. Um, it is a simple structure. Um, the problem, however, is that sometimes um, the reporting um, through the regional offices to head office uh, is sometimes poor. Um, the reasons almost tend to um, fall into the trap of, of, of um, <clears throat> managing or micromanaging their own regions um, reasonably independently. Uh, and then whenever the reporting goes through, um, a problem is reported. When it re reaches a, a, um, the level that it's actually become a serious problem, that's only really when it's picked up by people higher up that could actually have addressed it earlier on. Um, the advantage of the um, product specialization, and here we can um, um, specialize or we can differentiate between um, product lines, like I've given you the example. Obviously, if you have good product knowledge um, or by implementing a structure like this, you will sit with a salesperson who has intricate knowledge of a particular product and the applications of that product. <clears throat> However, um, it's relatively high cost because um, specialists don't come at um, um, at entry level. Um, the new product, um, if you are selling a new product, um, it only um, it, it it has a great number of advantages because. <clears throat> For instance, you will, if you have now just designed a new product and launching a new product, you will appoint people who are specialists um, and who know the new product. So there's not going to be a competition between um, selling um, new products and existing products um, because the new people will be focusing on the new product uh, and selling just the new product. That's um, a, a great strength of this particular um, of this particular structure. If we compare your customer-based options um, with account size um, um, and the market-centered um, um, differentiations can be made, um, you find that your your strengths with your um, market-centered one, where obviously the customer is very specific, um, and it, it, it's, it is the is is the one on the pedestal. The customer is what everything's about. We want to satisfy the customer's needs. We've built a good relationship with that customer. Um, so we have a very good understanding of what the customer's needs are. That's all good strengths, but it could also come at a cost because usually there's a lot of time and effort invested in it, and that comes at a cost. Um, account size is quite simple, um, based on the specific needs of the customer, um, usually um, based on the, uh, the, the amount that they've purchased, um, as well as the potential that they have to to grow and buy more in future is going to um, be some of the criteria that is used or usually the most common criteria that is used when actually um, the, the, the different accounts are rated A, B, C, D, like we'll see in an example later in the chapter. Right, 
So let's actually go to um, um, that example that I was referring to. And uh, the example we use is to determine how much, because the, remember this chapter is about structuring your uh, sales force. In other words, how many people do you actually need to be efficient in achieving your objectives? Well, there is a, um, a, a method that is discussed in, 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 in this course, which is the workload approach. Um, and you can use this approach to determine how many salespeople you need in your sales force if you know what the number of sales calls per year it is that you want to um, achieve, that you want your salespeople to make. And also if you have different classes of customers and you know what these different classes are. Right, let's dive into it. Um, I think the example in the textbook is on, sure, see now you search my memory. We go to the next screen, I'm not 100% sure on what page. I think it's page 381, yes. Right, the first step is that you actually will group your customers in different categories. A, B, C, D. A, if he spends over a million. B, if he spends between 500 and 1 million, whatever your criteria is. And it is done, the categories, according to the value of what they have purchased, as well as the potential that they um, for, for future purchases. You will also, secondly, identify the call frequency um, for each of these categories. And in other words, how many times do you need to fund uh, an A um, customer or a B customer or a C customer or a D customer. If the A customer is um, somebody who spends more than a million rand a year, um, you'll probably find that you will contact them. That could be telephony, or but usually it's a, it's it's visiting those customers at least once a month, at least twelve, 12 times a year. Um, thirdly, the total required workload per year is then calculated. Um, you multiply the call frequency in number two with the um, number that you've identified in number one. In other words, uh, and we'll see in the example when we apply it later um, how that makes sense. Right. Um, and then fourthly, the average number of calls per week, um, as well as um, what you want per salesperson, is then estimated for each of these um, customers. The fifth step is then to determine the working weeks per year. Right. Then we do the average number of working days per year. Um, and we calculate um, or, or multiply um, that by um, what we could identify in step four and step five. The final is uh, number seven is the number of salespeople that you will require, right? You do that by um, dividing the um, average weekly call rate um, multiplied by the number of working weeks um, into the number of customers multiplied by the call frequency. Now, that's a lot said, so let's rather uh, explain it at the hand of an, um, of an example. On the screen, you'll see that this business have um, four categories of groups of customers. The A customer spends more than one million pounds, and the D customer at the bottom spends roughly, uh, spends less than 150,000 pounds. Okay. For the A customer, you have 200 in your business that you deal with. Um, and then obviously for the D customer, you have 6,000. Okay. Now for the A customer, you're going to call that person 12 times a year. Call on them 12 times a year. For these types of people spending that amount, you'll probably visit them 12 times a year. Right. So step one, two, three, and four, uh, or step one, two, and three means that you have your categories. You have your number of businesses for each category, and you have your number of uh, calls that you're going to make for each of these customers. Therefore, if you want to calculate the total um, uh, annual workload, you will multiply 4A, 200 times 12, for B, 1,000 times 9, for C, 3,000 times 6, um, and for D, uh, customers, 6,000 times 3, because you'll only call them every quarter, three times a year, basically. Um, so every four months. You to total that, and that gives you 47,400. That's your uh, total annual workload. Now, how many times, uh, what's the total number of calls? That is the 12 plus the 9 plus the 6 plus the 3. That gives you 30. That's step 4. Step 5 would be there's 52 weeks in a year. Um, we are going to be productive for 43 because we um, are closed over the festive break for four weeks. We have a three-week um, um, 
period that our sales staff is off in the middle of the year and then maybe in April and in September we have a one week each. So in total, we basically have um, nine weeks that we are not um, um, full capacity and, and productive with our sales staff. Also our um, working weeks of 43 weeks. Now, if you, <coughs> my apologies, if you now calculate and uh, multiply step four with step five, you'll get to 1,290. That is for the weeks, the number of calls that you are going to make. Okay, 1,290. Um, if that is divided into the 47,400, which is the annual workload, you'll find that you need 37 people to achieve your objectives that you've set in that um, example at the top. It's quite simple and straightforward. Um, maybe, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe I'll include a calculation like this in the exam. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, right. How do you compensate your people? There are different ways. Some people are motivated by um, spending them more, but um, more often nowadays, people are looking to at least just to have a good standard of living. Even more so now in, in, in sort of um, towards the end of our COVID um, phase that we're in, um, a lot of people have lost their jobs, a lot of businesses had to cut down, a lot of businesses had kept their staff, but they are paying them less. And people have, I think, also realized that they actually can get away with, uh, with much less. And therefore, they just want to maintain a good standard of living. Right, but there are different compensation schemes. And let's see, the three most popular ways of, of paying your salespeople is paying them a fixed salary. That fixed salary is obviously going to be um, not to the maximum that they can earn, but it's usually for people who actually just want to maintain a good standard of living. Your people who are more driven, who are... Um, who want to um, who want to be paid more if they do more, they will work um, for commission only. That's risky, but the rewards are so much greater. Um, then the one that's most popular in, in sales um, profession is probably the one where you get a basic salary, which is obviously not going to be as high as your fixed salary, uh, because you also have the option of adding commission to that. To know that there's the security of getting the same amount every month, at least a minimum, and if you perform well in a particular month, you'll get more. You won't get less if you don't perform. You will still get your, your um, basic salary, but you will get more if you perform better and exceed your um, sales target. Right, the five types of salespeople that you will find. You'll get those people who are creatures of habit. They are just happy to maintain their standard of living. What, if you pay them well and they can maintain their standard of living, they're fine. Then you've got your satisfiers. These people are just doing enough to keep their jobs. Okay, they're not making any mistakes. They're just making target every month. They're not going through extra effort. If they make the target halfway through the month, they're not going to work harder. They just want to keep their jobs. Your trade offers are the people who say, you know what, I'd much rather go for a um, a combination of a salary plus commission because I want to balance my leisure time with my work. I want to earn enough to pay all, um, for all my expenses, but I also want that flexibility of maybe um, if I feel like playing a game of golf on a Wednesday afternoon, I can, uh, or maybe if I want to attend a, a function or a sporting event where my children are involved, I can actually don't feel bad that it's going to compromise my work um, because um, they are the trade offers who basically trade the working um, hours off against the um, leisure um, hours or social hours. Your goal oriented people, very driven, they want um, that employee of the month award. They want recognition from their peers. They want to be known as um, so and so have again this month exceeded and made the most sales. They want people to say that in meetings and they want that acknowledgement. And then you have your money oriented individuals in the sales force which um, want to who just want to make the absolute maximum they can. They're going to work 24 hours a day they can because they are going to earn more commission and that's what they actually want. That is just the illustration that you'll find on the screen of the compensation of sales um, versus sales volumes. Um, and you'll see that obviously your commission will be higher if your sales are higher. Right. Um, more importantly is the next and the final session of this chapter. 
uh, and you have done this already in your first year business marketing, um, but it's important that we know um, in everybody, not just the sales manager who sets the targets, but you as a, uh, as a salesperson will have to set your own targets within that. And it's important to know um, or be able to calculate what the minimum amount is that you have to, um, that you have to um, sell in a particular month or a particular period to ensure that you um, actually uh, are breaking even. In other words, you're not making a profit, but you're also not running at a loss. That's basically where your total cost, which is the variable cost plus your fixed cost, equals your total revenue or income for that same period. Right, let's look at an example. It would have been nice if we had a class where we can actually do this in class, but let's look at um, um, the home of Nemo, which is basically a, um, a tropical fish shop. They specialize in tropical fish, but they've got other pets that they also sell, um, but they specialize in specifically selling um, the clownfish that you find in the movie or the animated Disney um, film um, Finding Nemo. Um, average fish, average clown fish sells at 60 rand. The variable cost per fish is 40 rand, and the total monthly fixed cost for this business for this pet shop is 7,000 rand. Okay, how do we work? Um, how do we calculate the break even point? Why? Quite simply, we take the um, 7,000 rand, which is your total cost, and we divide the fixed cost into that, which is basically the 60 rand per fish minus the 40 rand variable cost per fish. Um, and then you'll find that your break even point would be 350 fishes that you have to sell to break even. You want to make a profit, you want to sell more than 350, but you also want to at least sell 350 just to survive. Right. This is the end of chapter 15, and I'll leave you with this, and I'll leave you with um, Harding Lawrence's quote, which says that, you know what? It's actually very important not to set compensation as a goal, but to rather find a work that you like, because if you like it, you'll probably do it well, and then the compensation will follow. Okay, I think it's a very important lesson, um, but it's very hard for, for, for people just starting out um, who have expenses um, and they want to still climb the corporate ladder. They want to see what they, um, 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 they want to achieve certain goals. Uh, it's very difficult, but you know, at the end of the day, um, when you reach your uh, a more matured age and you realize, you know what, I've been chasing a lot of things unnecessary. There's a lot of things that I don't really need. <laughs> um, but those lessons we learn along the way. But um, I think it is a very, very important lesson um, that he is um, that he is reminding us of. And that is to find a job. Find, I know initially you're not going to be choosy because, I mean, you need a job. Um, once you've graduated, um, but it's 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 better to um, to to find a job that you're going to enjoy, and then you will probably be good at it, and the compensation will follow as it says. I've gone through that myself. I went for a job interview um, a number of years ago, more than 25 years ago where I would have earned six times more than I was what I was earning at that stage. Um, I was in my in my late 20s. Um, I just got married. Um, it was a significant um, um, boost to the household income. I got the job after I went for the interview. I got back home and my wife said to me, you didn't you don't look excited for somebody who just got um, a job, almost a sort of a dream job. And I said to her, you know what, um, I can do the job. I, I'm definitely, I was the best candidate for the job. And I'll be able to do the job and I'll do the job well. I'm just not sure if I'm going to be excited to get to work every day to do it. Um, and at that point, she gave me a piece of paper that um, a colleague of, of, of ours have given her, um, and it basically said, so and so wants to see you. Um, that was at, at that point my my superior. Um, and usually, when that happens, you know that you're in trouble if you need to go see that person. Um, long story short, he basically offered me an opportunity that um, was not close financially and um, compensation-wise with what I was going to get for the for, for for the job that I just got. Um, and after days of delivering, 
I actually took the latter. Uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to earn. Um, and it lasted me for 22 years and created a very nice career for me. So um, reflecting back on that decision I've taken, I'm pretty sure by that time I did not know um, Harding Lawrence, and I have not heard this um, quote before. Um, and um, reflecting back on it, that's exactly actually what happened to me. I chose a job that I enjoyed and the compensation followed. Um, people, um, thanks. Uh, I hope you um, find value in the session. Um, this is the end of chapter 15. I'm going to take a short break, maybe make myself a cup of coffee, and I'm going to also then uh, do a recording for chapter six, uh, chapter 17. Sorry, we're not doing chapter 16 in this textbook. Thanks very much. I appreciate it.